and welcome to Pursuit of Motion. Today we have Dr. Bickerton, a uh, 40 year uh, political science major, major, professor. Professor. Um, <laughs> I was a major in yeah. former life. What was that like? Probably much as it is today. I mean, my experience as an undergrad probably wasn't that different than yours. You think so? Yeah, maybe. <coughs> um, it's a real privilege to have you on. I mean, you literally wrote the textbook that we learned from today, you and uh, Gagnon. I really would like to know what introduced you to the field of political science. What drew you, what inspired you to this area? Right. First thing I would say is this about the textbook, which is in the seventh edition, and we're working now on the eighth edition. Eight editions. It'll be my last, I think. Um, it's an edited collection of essays. So you're right, Gagnon and I have been editors for all that time, contributed chapters ourselves on different topics. But really, the work was in gathering together a bunch of different political scientists who were experts in particular subfields of Canadian politics. And that's what makes the book a good book. I think it's a good book. It's because we have people who really know what they're talking about, writing on topics that they specialize in, right? And I, I, I find actually that that's been tremendously helpful to me through the years because you, know, you have to read everything they submit to you. You have to read, edit it, get it back to them. They get back to you. So by the end of the process, which is, by the way, about two years from the time that you start the process to the time it appears in print, you're much more informed about all the different aspects of Canadian politics than you were at the start. So, really, uh, I think that this has probably been, been the key to me keeping interested in the topic over 40 years, is doing this textual thing, because we're changing up authors, and we're always getting new perspectives, and learning new stuff as we go along. So, uh, that has helped me to keep interested in Canadian politics. Sorry, what was your question? <laughs> uh, the, the question was what drew you to the field of political science, but it's interesting that that's the way you discuss the impact of putting together an edited book because it's almost the same logic of the podcast. It's finding the expert in the area and you know making the information more accessible with the hope that people can generate a more yeah. whole view off of it. But what is it that specifically drew you into political science? Yeah. Ooh, good question. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, as an undergrad, I majored in political science. Um, did an honors degree in political science uh, at Acadia University back in the 1970s. And um, why political science attracted me? You know, I think it was uh, my growing up years. Um, I grew up in Sydney, Cape Breton, uh, in the 1960s. Sydney and Cape Breton in general was dependent upon a dying industry, coal and steel. And the 1960s were a time of crisis for the community because the multinational corporation that ran the coal and steel industry, a British multinational, announced that they were going to close everything down, like shut everything down. And we're talking about the employment base of the whole community would be gone overnight. And it led to a major kind of political protest at the community level to try to get government to do something to prevent this from happening. And in the end, the federal government took over the coal mines, uh, created DEFCO, which was Cape Breton Development Corporation, and ran the coal mines. And they finally closed in 1999. So for 30 years, they actually put off this crisis for 30 years, which made a huge difference in my life and a lot of other lives. The provincial government took over the steel plant, created a, a provincially owned steel plant called Cisco. So I lived on a socialist island, essentially, uh, because we had federal ownership of the coal mines, provincial ownership of the steel mill, you know, and of course there were other businesses, but that was the core of the economy. So, you know, I got used to politics being a really important part of people's lives because public ownership 
automatically mean that government's involved in all kind of economic decisions that in other places they wouldn't be, right? So g growing up in that atmosphere got me really interested, I think, in politics, and that carried over into my undergrad years and eventually into grad school. Interesting, and I think uh, I've been up to Sydney once, and I think you can really see that there's sort of, uh, you know, remnants of a depression going on there. There, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of development or industry, I would say. But that's a really it's post-industrial now. Post. Yeah. So it's trying to figure out, you know, how it can sustain itself. And to be honest, uh, things are better, better now than they were for a long time. Really. And things are actually looking up. For the island now, um, you know, for 20 years after their coal mines and steel mill closed, it was very depressing to go home and to see the situation and people leaving and businesses closing and you know housing that was dilapidated and abandoned. Now the vacancy rate in Sydney is one percent. You know, <laughs> you can't find a place to rent. Um, there's a lot of new businesses that have started up. But uh, in some ways, it's, of course, you never like to see a community have to go through that kind of economic stress. But in some ways, it's, it's better. The coal mines and the steel mills, they were dirty jobs. Cape Breton had a really high cancer rate, you know, and uh, lung disease because of the coal miners, you know. Um, so they were, they were dirty jobs and... You know, the smell of money was the, you know, the sulfur spewing from the steel plant kind of thing. You know, people couldn't put out their wash without turning orange because of the sulfur in the air. And when I think back to that, you know, I'd say it's a good thing that, you know, that's no longer the case there. But it's taken a long time, a couple of generations, you know, to really transition to, to a different kind of economy. And it's such a beautiful place, Cape Breton. And people, you know, it's ranked as one of the top islands in the world in terms of tourism, right? And I know there's some deep loyalty to people to go back home. You know, if they can't work there, they go back home in the summer whenever they can and enjoy the island. And so, uh, you know, it'll never be what it was, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Yeah, it sounds like, you know, pressure breeds innovation and they really needed to change away from the less sustainable business, you know? Assuming that, well, <laughs> you know what, it it was just one of any number of regions throughout North America that were dependent on coal and steel that went through that. I mean, it wasn't just Cape Breton. Uh, you could see uh, regions throughout the United States, uh, in Europe, uh, that were dependent on coal and steel, and they they've all they all went into decline and had to make a transition or not, you know, away from coal and steel because it just was a dying industry. Um, and most of the coal and steel today is produced in, you know, third world countries or developing countries or China, which produces, I think, half of all the well, steel in the it's world. It's cleaner over there, right? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. But um, anyway, you know what I mean? It was, mm -hmm. it was nothing specifically about Cape Breton. It was just happened to be that industrial base was disappearing. And, you know, we, we are into a post-industrial world now. And, uh, so it's a good thing, you know, to move on from that uh, old industry. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So I'd, I'd love to pivot and find out what led you to St. FX. Okay. How would you say that being at St. FX impacted your career and research? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, um, kind of fluky I ended up here at a university which was close to home. I mean, I'd have to be at Cape Breton University to be any closer to home, actually. Um, why, why I did a PhD in the first place, it's why you end up going in one direction and not another. I mean, I never planned on doing a PhD. Um, you know, I thought about being a teacher. I applied to law school a couple of times and always decided in the end not to go. I just kind of couldn't see myself in that role. Um, spent a couple of years just booting around and doing different kinds of jobs in the late 70s. Spent a year in Alberta working in the construction industry, you know, during the first big boom there. Um, and then I just felt like I needed to get back to school. So uh, I went back 
and enrolled in, to do a master's in history at Dalhousie, to be honest. Uh, got through maybe three weeks classes and realized that wasn't for me. So uh, I dropped out and um, did something else with myself that year. Actually spent several months on a Japanese squid fishing vessel wow. in the Cabot Strait uh, of Cape Breton, between Cape Breton and Newfoundland, in the middle of the winter, by the way, which was an interesting experience in and of itself. Spent some time uh, sorting mail in the major mail sorting building in Halifax. I have to say, the worst job ever. Did you get any famous mail though? Any anything addressed? No, we were very fine. <laughs> you never do. You know, you were supposed to take that and slot it here and slot it there. And all the people, uh, the managers, were all former military guys, and they ran the place that way. You know, and the workforce is really alienated. And you know, there were a lot of strikes in those days. The postal service was famous in Canada for going on strike. So that was the time that you know I was there, and I found out pretty quickly that. Man, I gotta get back to school. I don't want to spend the rest of my life, you know, doing this or jobs like this. So yeah, so I ended up uh, applying to a master's degree at Carleton without a thought other than I just need to get back to school and politics is going to be the thing I study. <clears throat> and I went back in 1979 to do a master's degree at Carleton, and I was really challenged. I had been on school for several years and um, I didn't know if I could do it and uh, you know I, I never worked as hard in my life as I worked that year just just to prove to myself and, and to uh, the other people there that uh, you know that I could handle the workload and, uh, and that I could perform okay and at the end of that year actually one of my professors um, Leo Panich is sort of just passed away last year. He's sort of one of Canada's most famous Marxists, actually. Uh, and he encouraged me to stay on and, and do a PhD. Um, so that's how I ended up, uh, you know, doing that. Uh, and once you commit to a PhD, you're committed to five years, really, of study. Um, so it's, it's not something I would encourage students today to do, to be honest. Really? It's such a huge commitment, and uh, the job market is uh, not good. Uh, I, I've had a lot of, even in my day, I have a lot of uh, friends I went through the PhD with who never ended up getting a tenure track job, and uh, had to, you know, switch into a different career at some point, or or didn't finish. The attrition rate was really high in terms of finishing PhD. So I really caution students to think long and hard before committing themselves to doing a PhD, to be honest. I hate to say that, but you know, that's the way it is these days. Um, I wasn't finished degree uh, when I got the job at St. Evex. A job came up at St. Evex. My wife was pregnant. We were gonna have our first child. Uh, I knew, you know, my funding was running out. So I knew that uh, I had to get a job. And just so happened, a job came up at St. of X, which I was very happy about. I never expected to get it. Came down and interviewed for it. And ended up replacing two, well, I wasn't replacing two professors, but ended up teaching courses of two retiring professors at St. of X, both of whom had quite famous reputations locally at this university, John Stewart, who went on to become Senator Stewart, uh, for the next 20 years he spent in the Senate, and uh, Walter Contact, who had been the head of the department, you know, forever. Um, and you had to retire at 65 in those days. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just so happened, you know, that, that, that those jobs became available the year that I was far enough along that I could have a shot at the job. But I have to say that if it was today, I never would have got hired at St. Vex. Uh, today, you have to have a completed PhD, you have to have a couple of publications at least in your back pocket. Um, it's so much tougher now than it was then, you know, when I think about uh, the situation today compared to then. I'm sounding like quite a, quite a, <laughs> quite a downer, quite a bummer when I'm talking about that. So I was fortunate, I was just lucky, 
And I was happy, of course, to come back to Nova Scotia. And so was my wife. She's from Cape Breton as well. And uh, we had three kids, uh, raised three kids here. I've had a good career. I was in a very good department. You know, people got along well. Um, so I consider myself very lucky, to be honest. The barriers to becoming a professor nowadays, would you say that's because of the competition or because standards are rising in education? Yeah, I think it's both of those things. Standards are definitely higher, but that's because, in part, because of the competition. You know, mm-hmm. as, 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 more, as uh, more and more people applying for jobs or people, you know, with completed PhDs and a couple of publications, uh, then that raises the bar for everyone else applying. So I think that over the years, you know, that's just the way it's gone. And, and then, of course, you know, you have to factor in as well you know, equity, diversity, inclusion, uh, departments that were heavily male in terms of uh, the composition. Um, they've had to try to diversify in terms of faculty, which, of course, is great. It's good and uh, makes for a better, more representative department. But if you're a white male, uh, it just makes the number of appointments available, you know, that much fewer. Um, so I think it's it's all of those things, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting hearing the way that your life story was sort of affected by strikes and movement away from education because that's very similar to the experience I had. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Right when I graduated high school, I went to audio engineering school, which is why I know how to okay. you know, set up a oh, production. Good, good to know. And then when COVID hit, I decided, you know, I I want to work. I don't want to go to school. I had no intention of liberal arts education. And after three years and the mill was, uh, the sawmill um, was talking about strike, I said, I need to go learn. I can't yeah. keep doing this. So it's interesting that yeah. we sort of had that same the there, I would say. Yeah. Um, so I got to ask before we dive deeper into actual politics, what drives your passion to continue teaching? Yeah, you know, I've often that phrase, you know, passion. Um, it's standard now, of course. Everyone talks about, you know, being passionate about this or passionate about that. I don't know if I was ever passionate about politics. I don't know if I'm passionate about politics today, to be honest. Uh, maybe it just depends on what you mean by passionate. You know, I was interested, intellectually interested in it. But I never felt I had a passion for it. I never felt like I would ever want to pursue a political career, actually run for office. I never felt I wanted to work for a political party, uh, help someone else get elected to office. And I've had so many students over the years who have been passionate about politics, got involved with political parties, and helping people get elected or even getting involved themselves. You know, people are now cabinet ministers, you know, Nova Scotia's finance minister, you know. Uh, He's a former student, Uh, Sean Fraser who's the Minister of Housing Infrastructure, he's a former student. Seamus O'Regan, who's, you know, I think he's a Labour Minister, he's a former student. And through the years, you know, there's been a lot of those folks um, that have come along. And uh, Greg McEachern and Fred DeLore, they're on Power of Politics on CBC Television Weekly, you know, talking about politics because they were, you know, insiders with their X-rings showing you know can't wait (laughs) uh so they they're all passionate about politics um i had an intellectual interest in it which is different it's dispassionate uh you actually want to try to step back from the the emotional aspect of it and you kind of need to do that in order to try to be analytical about what's going on and not get caught up in being on one side or the other or you know, there's a lot of that intensity in politics, partisanship, and so on. So to be a political scientist is really to be able to step back from that and just weigh different factors and try to analyze what's going on from from a more intellectual standpoint. So not passionate, I don't think. Just interest. Occasionally I get passionate about teaching, actually. Uh, but I could be teaching not necessarily Paul. I could be teaching anything, but I think it's the teaching part of it that sometimes brings out oh, some passionate Interesting. feelings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a perfect segue into the next question. Because, uh-huh. uh, you know, 
given the current political climate, how important would you say teaching students how to think is versus what to mm. think? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, you know, this question is interesting. Um, I've never taught uh, students or even thought about teaching students what to think, uh, to be honest. Um, what to think about, however. There's a difference there. So, of course, in order to really learn how to think in an analytical or critical way, a dispassionate way, if I can put it that <laughs> like that, uh, you have to have a subject that some to get immersed in, you know. So, uh, a lot of teaching is teaching students what to think about. Like, okay, you're in a political science class, you're in a Canadian politics class. We're gonna we're gonna think about this topic and and try to pull it apart and try to understand it as best we could, contextual factors, which is so absent in a lot of political discussion just between people or between politicians. You know, context is totally lost. Um, and yet that's so important in terms of understanding what's going on, you know, and understanding outcomes. So you're teaching students what to think about in a sort of a deepest way that you possibly can some students will get that and you know will immerse themselves as much as they can given the time limitations in in the subject matter uh i do uh, yeah i i think the idea of teaching students what to think and i know that uh, sometimes students might think that you're trying to tell them what to think because you're being critical of this policy or that politician, um, critical rather, rather than partisan, if you know what I mean. Uh, and they would think that uh, you're trying to tell them, you know, not to, not to support this person or not to, uh, or to think this way rather than that way about a political idea. I think inevitably that gets involved. You know, I don't think anyone is totally neutral bias, bias is always part part and parcel of being a human being I, I know I have some biases uh, but I hope they're informed at least you know that I can I could justify why I think the way I do you know oftentimes it's based on I prefer to think about this kind of society or living in this kind of society rather than that kind of society and therefore you know I have a certain bias toward this direction in public policy or in politics rather than that direction. You know, so of course I I don't like fascism or authoritarianism. You know, I'm a committed Democrat. I think that's probably true for 90%, you know, of faculty at universities in Canada. Uh, as it probably is true for the students as well. But they might not be as aware of what's involved in a, in a democracy, like an actually effective working democracy, you know, with all of its flaws. Uh, it's still so much preferable, you know, to alternative systems, you know, dictatorial or authoritarian or, uh, you know, other kinds of political systems that uh, deny people freedom of choice. Uh, so is that a bias? Yeah, I guess it's a bias, you know, but it's a bias because you want to live in that kind of society, you know, with, with justice and freedom and all those good sounding stuff, you know, that's part and parcel of, of it. Um, so how to think rather than what to think. Uh, you need to teach students what to think about rather than what to think. Uh, and in the process of doing that, you're teaching them how to think. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> with the that's timer, the and I'm picking too long with my answers. Probably that's why. Oh no, that's the dear wife texting. Not really married. My my wife? Nope, that would be mine. Oh yeah. <laughs>
Let's go ahead. How did my wife get your email? She's interested to know what your answers look like. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so you sent me a video about Canadian exceptionalism. Yeah. I enjoyed watching it. Okay. I'm going to make sure it's linked in the bio so that any of you watching can hear Dr. Bickerton's own words. Right. But can you explain the concept of uh, Canadian exceptionalism? Sure, sure. This was for uh, a podcast or website, I guess, uh, called faculty.net. People could check it out. It's based in London, England. And they get faculty from all over the place, all over the world, to, to give little 20-minute segments on something they've written or some specialty uh, that they that they uh, trained in. And for me, they just took uh, an article that I wrote, which talked about the Canadian party system, and introduced the idea of exceptionalism, Canadian exceptionalism. Um, so, what was the point? The point of the article was this, that when you compare Canada to similar countries, you know, Western countries with similar political systems to ours, uh, especially with the same electoral system as ours, first past the post electoral system. Our party system looks much different than than those other examples. So right off the bat, Canada is sort of exceptional in that sense. How does it look different? One thing is, we have multiple parties who are competing over a long period of time since 1921. Election 1921, Canada's had more than two parties competing for power. And now we have five, you know, six if you stretch it. Um, that's unusual. Uh, the second thing is, you know, we have major parties. Yeah, two major parties, it's true. There's only been two parties really that have ever governed Canada. But their share of the popular vote, if you add it up now, is only about 65, 66% of the total vote which is the smallest share of popular vote for two major parties anywhere in the world, I think, um, with, you know, in comparative systems. So there's that. The other thing that makes Canada exceptional is we've had one party that has really been quite dominant throughout the 20th century, the current party in power, the Liberal Party of Canada. The natural party. Naturally governing party. That's how you know, political scientists and liberals themselves, or they think of themselves, the naturally governing party, they'd be in power for long stretches of time, out of power for a brief period of time, back in power again for another long stretch. This is very unusual. This is exceptional to have that kind of one party dominance. So all of these things taken together, can is exceptional. What explains that? Why? What explains one party dominance? what explains this multi-party competition with all of these insurgent protest parties popping up all the time and lasting for a long time, you know? Um, and that's what I attempted to do in, uh, in this article that I wrote, is to explain that. It's actually turned into a chapter in my textbook that I read here on Canadian politics. Uh, and uh, most places, class politics is dominant. In other words, politics tends to be a competition between the left and the right. You know, sort of worker, labor oriented, left wing parties versus kind of business oriented, right wing parties. And they compete for power. You know, the classic is conservative against labor or whatever, that kind of Republican against Democrat, you know, in the United States. We never had that. In Canada, the dominant party is a centrist party, and it tries to straddle the center, competing both against the more left-wing party, the NDP, and the more party more to the right, the conservatives, and trying to hold that center ground. So centrism is very unusual. And to make this long story short, it's largely because to say it, Quebec. It's largely because of the existence of Quebec and of a cultural issue, which is the language issue in Canada, you know, ethno-linguistic, which used to be also a religious division within Canada, you know, Catholicism, Protestantism back in the old days. And cultural politics has prevented Canadian politics from polarizing 
between you know left and right because left right polarization is it's about socioeconomic issues right division of wealth and redistribution of wealth and you know that's been the dominant uh, frame of politics elsewhere but we had these cultural issues national unity french english relations you know the place in quebec and that's made centrism impossible in the long run you know other centrist parties elsewhere have kind of disappeared the liberals remain the dominant party and it's because cultural politics continue to be an important part of Canadian politics. I think that's why. And and at the end of this uh, chapter uh, I wrote, I speculated that we may be coming to, to an end of Canadian exceptionalism. You know, the way things are gone, going, the Liberals have been moving further and further onto left-wing territory. You look at the NDP and the Liberals now, they're almost indistinguishable in terms of their, what they stand for. So they're solidly on the left. Our Conservative Party, which used to be leaning toward the center, it was kind of center-right. Brian Mulroney, think about Brian Mulroney and his politics, for instance. You know, it was very much sort of center-right and moderate, you know. Uh, they're a much more of a right-wing party now. You know, ever since the Reform Party in the 1990s, conservatism in Canada has become true blue, you know, right-wing conservative politics, yeah. right-wing populism, if you like. And so we, we've gotten this polarization that's happened in Canada now, ideologically. And so it does raise the question of whether Canadian exceptionalism now is, is uh, more in the past than in the future. Interesting. See, it almost sounds like, you know, uh, agreeableness plays a big factor in there. It sounds as though, you know, exceptionalism, just from, from my understanding, is the fact that Canadians can generally accept who is in power and accept their vision for a long period of time and it seems like now that things are sort of moving apart as yeah. you had said with the you know the ndp liberal coalitions and then the more you know <laughs> yeah. southern natured conservative yeah. party that we're currently seeing yeah would you say agreeableness plays a big factor in exception no, it's not about agreeableness to be honest as being central to the whole thing but uh certainly a moderate uh, political culture, a uh, fairly high degree of consensus most of the time, um, and that was certainly true, you know, for decades, really. And I think that that's changed, that that broad consensus, you know, over yeah, there were differences between the parties, but they were all kind of gravitated toward the center, and there was a lot of consensus about what should be done. A little bit more of this, a little bit less of that. Uh, that seems to yeah, be, be less the case now since the 1990s really that's when the big change happened um, so maybe the agreeableness as you say maybe that has declined during that period of time and maybe our politics reflects that too you know it's more rancorous uh, maybe it's a bit more personalized um, there's less middle ground you know, that parties can stand on. Uh, so, yeah, maybe agreeableness is a good way of putting that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, and so how would you describe the current state of the Canadian political field? I know we're kind of going over that right now, but yeah. like, what implications do you think that has for the upcoming election? Right. Uh, well, yeah, you're right. We have been kind of talking about that. Canada has more polarized politics now than it's had in the past. Um, yeah, we have a situation that I mentioned previously uh, where the party in power is governing on the smallest percentage of the popular vote of any governing party in Canadian history. You know, 32, 33% of the vote uh, and being the government was unheard of um, until 2019. So the last couple of elections have been pretty unusual that way. Um, where, where, where does that leave us in terms of the coming election? Um, I think the, cons you know, the Conservative Party, um, which was a union between, uh, the Reform Party, renamed the Canadian Alliance, and the old Progressive Conservative Party, which folded its tent and basically was absorbed by the Reform Party. That all happened in 2003. And that created 
one main party, you know, to the right of center. But it was a different party, as I said before, uh, than the old Progressive Conservatives Party. Um, if anything, that Conservative Party has leaned even further to the right. And there's most of the change in Canadian politics, I think, has revolved around changes in the nature of Canadian conservatism. And there was a lot of internal struggles over the direction of Canadian conservatism with different candidates representing different wings of the party, you know. Um, and I think with Aaron O'Toole, you know, the previous leader of the party, he was more leaning toward the center of the spectrum, but then he lost the election in 2021. Uh, and he Conservatives are very quick to remove leaders. Oh yeah, one lose election, one chance, and the the rallying of the the party to a more right wing candidate in Pierre Polyev, and it, it he won by a huge margin of the vote in the conservative leadership contest that followed Aaron O'Toole stepping down, and to me it really represented in a way, you know, the party making a clean break with the old progressive conservative centrist oriented conservatism uh, and embracing fully a more right-wing populist message which you know populism in our politics is not at the level it is in the united states thankfully uh, because i don't think it's a healthy development but it's much more present now than it's been for a long time and maybe in an unprecedented way because one of the two major parties now is clearly, you know, more of a populist party. We'll see if they win power, whether they can govern uh, from that kind of populist uh, perspective. But certainly, you know, populism has changed our politics and uh, has widened the gap, I think, you know, between, uh, between the parties and between right and left in particular. And populism in Canada is a right new phenomenon, or a right of center phenomenon, let me put it that way. It's a conservative phenomenon. Uh, we don't really see populism on the left in Canada anymore. I mean, briefly, we, well, historically we did, maybe in the 20s and 30s in particular, there was a left wing populism. Um, but populism now is much more a feature of, of, uh, of the conservative right. Um, but we haven't really seen it in power in Canada. Uh, so I, I don't know whether um, what that will look like. And we may find out, of course, uh, if the polls right now are indicating a huge lead uh, for the Conservatives and Pierre Polyev, whether he might moderate his populism and become you know, more of a standard politician, or whether he'll actually follow through uh, with more populist themes once he's elected, which is anti-statism, is a big part of that. And Canada has always had a, a large state. Swamp. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. But, this, you know, historically, I'll go back to a famous quote in the 1930s. In Canada, it's either the state or the United States. You know, that government and the public sector has been very important in Canada. Because otherwise, you know, we just get rolled over uh, culturally, economically, politically by the United States. So the government has served us well in Canada, right? Uh, of course, you know, there, there's always a need to, to restrain government when it, uh, when it becomes too overweeny. Uh, and so you get that, uh, that back and forth that happens too. And maybe that's, uh, that's one of the roles that the Conservatives have played uh, historically too. Yeah, if I was in a position to speculate, I would certainly say that that restraining might be going on now with the uh, oncoming blue wave that I'm predicting here. Okay. <laughs> you Perfect. know, perhaps it may not, you know, manifest itself, but I mean, even Trudeau's wife left him. You know, his, his cabinet's leaving him, and, uh, you know, we can talk about Polly M's populism, and I'll certainly say there was a time where I was very motivated by him yeah. and then I learned what populism actually is right. and I realized you know what I was encountering what I was looking at the strategy and I think that um, it's easy to be doomer to be negative yeah. about Polyev but I watched his um, acceptance speech when he became the leader of the conservatives did you happen to see that by any chance yeah. mm -hmm. 
it was a very unifying speech. And after such, I don't want to say scorched earth, but a very Trumpian, DeSantis esque, you know, yeah. pursuit of becoming elected. Yeah. His vision was then okay. We need to come together and bring the country. So forgive me, but I am I'm actually optimistic about okay. Paul Leo. Okay. I wouldn't say that uh, his track record like proves that he will do anything particularly yeah. impressive. But at the very least, he knows how to sort of put his finger on that nerve, right? Because that's a, a perfect transition into the next thing: is populism a risk or a threat in current Canadian uh, society? And I would say populism is a diagnosis, and if people resonate with a populist it's because they see that there are issues in the society that doesn't mean that the populist necessarily has the prescription yeah. is able to fix it but uh what are, what are your thoughts on you know the rise of populism uh first thing i don't think it should bring trudeau's personal property oh, yeah <laughs> into the discussion i don't think it's fair that kind of you know personal dispersion lots of people get divorced and uh, you know the job of prime minister is incredibly demanding, very hard on families. Um, so I have some sympathy there yeah. for that situation. Uh, there's something uh, in politics called the discipline of power, uh, and you pointed out uh, that uh, Polyev appeared to be somewhat of a different politician after he won the leadership compared to the Polyev before the leadership. I mean, if you look at Polyev's career as a politician, and basically that's been his whole adult life, he's been a politician. Mm -hmm. He went to Parliament in his 20s, so he really hasn't had any other job. 24, I believe. Yeah, and he was yeah. a staffer before that. So it's politics has been his whole life. Um, he was seen under the, in the Harper government as a bit of a political attack dog, you know, and, and oftentimes uh, parties or governments uh, we'll have individuals like that who they'll, you know, they're particularly good at, at hominem attacks and other kinds of uh, sharp personal attacks, uh, and they're usually referred to as attack dogs. Um, can be useful in politics to have someone like that, but you don't want that person uh, to be out of control, so you usually keep tight control of them. Like Harper never gave Polly have a major role within his cabinet. Um, he used Polyev uh, rather than had him as any kind of a right-hand man, you know what I mean? Um, now, Polyev has to transition from that role historically that he learned how to play very well. And we can see that he has techniques that serve him very well in politics. You know, he's very intelligent, he's very quick, um, he's able to concisely sort of uh, boil issues down to a, a nice slogan that works well in politics, um, retail politics. So we'll see if he can transition from that role to uh, governing, uh, be in the role of a, a government leader, which is a very different kind of role with very different kinds of pressures and demands and choices, uh, calls for a different kind of personality than the role of opposition critic. Some politicians can make that transition, others not, don't do it successfully. I think back to John D. For Baker, who was an excellent opposition leader and critic of the liberal governments he faced. But once he became prime minister, he wasn't able to effectively make the transition from being that opposition critic to, to running a government. And his, his government uh, didn't fare so well. Um, so we'll see. You know how Polyev makes so. If in fact he gets the opportunity, we'll see whether he can make the transition or not, uh, or whether in fact the political environment has changed so dramatically that he can be successful, actually, uh, and still maintain his political personality uh, that he's developed up to this point in time. So those big open questions for me. You know? Yeah, I think to to a degree, there's certainly a risk of a change in leadership. You know, somebody new coming into power, and mm -hmm. you know, as much as we, as it's easy to speak ill of Justin Trudeau, we still live in an operating, functioning society. So yeah. I do need to, <laughs> you know, to say my my thanks for that. Yeah. Um. So I'd like to move on now into 
conversation that you really, I wouldn't say spent a lot of time, but very much made sure we, we were aware of in the classroom. That's the difference between multiculturalism and multinationalism. Oh, all right, yeah. That was probably the key takeaway, I uh -huh. thought, was that you cannot lump you know, the various, the, the three big groups into multiculturalism, Canada's, you know, three nations. So is that something you'd be willing to speak to? Yeah, about? sure. I mean, uh, I, I think it's it's kind of a natural thing, especially for uh, English-speaking Canadians uh, who aren't immigrants, uh, to think about multiculturalism in terms of, it includes everybody. And to a certain extent, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, that... It's a big part of Canadian identity, it's respect and tolerance for diversity. You know, diversity is our strength, as the, you know, politicians are fond of saying that and so on. And people immediately think about multiculturalism uh, when they think about that. But sometimes um, they, they tend to lump in uh, important uh, subgroups in the Canadian population who consider themselves to be indigenous peoples or nations. And I know we can use the term indigenous with a little eye or a big eye, you know. So First Nations, Inuit, Métis, big eye indigenous, you know, absolutely. They are nations, peoples with cultures, history, languages that were bred here, you know and developed here on this land and as a result they resent it when they're included on the same basis as other minority groups who have uh, come to Canada, immigrated to Canada, left their home cultures behind and are integrating into this new Canadian nation that they're becoming part of, willingly so, right? Multiculturalism actually helps them to integrate and not feel like they're inferior uh, in the process of doing that. But integration is still important for them when they come to a new country. Uh, and Indigenous Canadians and French Canadians, Quebecois in particular, uh, they don't want to be considered to be in the same category as other ethnic minority groups that have emigrated to Canada. Um, they see themselves as nations that were formed here and who have different kinds of claims and they're not seeking to integrate into the majority, English-speaking majority, in Canada. They're instead seeking to retain or win autonomy as peoples or as nations within this multinational framework we call Canada. So it's more complicated than just being Canada's a multicultural country, or it's great, we treat everyone the same, equality. Of course, those are important values at the basis of Canadian nationhood. But in addition to that, it's a federal country, respect for federal diversity, which means territorial autonomy for different provinces. But it's also a multinational country. In 2006, Parliament recognized, in an almost unanimous vote, that Quebec constitutes a nation within the United Canada. Uh, the Constitution of Canada states First Nations, Indigenous, Métis are, have treaty rights and Aboriginal rights that are different from other Canadians. Separate, they have a different kind of citizenship. Yeah, they have all of the rights of Canadians, but they also have these treaty and Aboriginal rights, which they have because they predated modern Canada. You know? So Quebec, indigenous peoples, they're minority nations, really. Uh, they're, they're, they're peoples, they're nations. With regard to indigenous people, too, they're not one nation. Right? They're many different nations, many different languages, cultures, histories. Um, so they're not like Quebec in that sense. They're nations in a different way than Quebec claims to be a nation. I mean, the, ab the absolute beautiful thing about Canada, as well as its biggest challenge, is to keep this whole thing together. Uh, so far, so good. I mean, we, we almost broke up as a nation, especially in 1995. We came very close to having Quebec separated from Canada. 
who are struggling and will continue to struggle throughout the 21st century with Indigenous rights, indig implementing Indigenous self-government, and defining you know, what that's going to look like in the end. Um, so we have those challenges of diversity for sure. But Canada seems to be handling diversity and deep diversity. I mean, I think about Quebec. I think about Indigenous peoples as deep diversity, going beyond simply recognition of difference to actually saying you have the right to be uh, self-governing, you know, and to have claims on territory in Canada um, as a people. So that's deep diversity. Canada has done better than any other country in the world I can think of, of living with that, accepting that, and in effect, getting out with it and making the country uh, work, you know, for everybody. Uh, you know, I try not to put on rose-colored glasses here and say, oh, everything is just great, and you know, Canada's the best country in the world, you know, like John Quincy would always say that, Canada's the best, you know. Uh, but you have to you have to recognize and admit that uh, multiculturalism is very popular, more so than the case for any other country in the world. Canada's been successful at multiculturalism, the first country in the world to have a multicultural policy, by the way. And arguably, too, you know, we've gone the furthest towards allowing autonomy or or recognizing the claim to autonomy of both Quebec as a majority French-speaking uh, people within Canada and Indigenous peoples, uh, which has been much more recent in terms of recognizing that and acknowledging that and accommodating that. I, I get that. It's only really been the since the 1970s that we, you know, started down that road, but we are on that road. And so uh, I hope that Canada continues, you know, to be able to do it, to be able to travel that road uh, with, without the country, you know, falling into acrimonious political division about it. So far, so good, anyway. And that, for me, was the most important thing we learned in your class. Yeah. Was more or less, like, how, how could we possibly be juggling these different groups? How does Canada even still exist? Well, yeah. it's by respecting the nations within and then also having a multicultural lens that, you know, you can join us even if you're not one of these groups. Yeah, I mean, it, and, it, you know, it, it's counterintuitive. Like, uh, and, and the criticisms of multiculturalism and, and of special status for Quebec in the 80s and 90s reached kind of a high point because, you know, the, especially the majority were saying, well, you know, how can you have unity and diversity? I mean, how, how can you have a Canadian identity based on recognition of our differences? So there was a lot of concern that that wasn't workable, you know, and that it had to be a common Canadian identity, a common Canadian nationhood, uh, absolute equality for every individual, no special status or rights. To some extent, Pierre Trudeau's vision of Canada. Uh, so that just wasn't going to work, you know, for Canada. Uh, so we had to find a, a different way. And, uh, and I think... I think we did find a different way. All right, I'd uh, love to switch gears a little bit and explore some lighter but sure. still relevant topics, uh, you know, in respect with respect to Canadian politics. Uh, so this game, uh, I'm just going to ask a few questions okay. that sort of, I think everybody may have a stake in, and we'll see sure. your thoughts. So right. I'd like to start with who are your top three prime ministers <laughs> and why. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning, uh, before we started the podcast, that... Uh, it's not a question I'm particularly fond of. Yeah. Um, who are the top three prime ministers? I know that some historians have played that game and have made lists and based it on longevity and power and, you know, economic success while they were in power, uh, things like that. Uh, but I just find circumstances, political and economic circumstances, so dramatically different in different eras of Canadian history. Uh, that it's really hard to compare across those eras. Like, how do you compare 19th century Canada, you know, what John A. Macdonald, Wilfrid Laurier faced as prime ministers compared to Pierre Trudeau and Brian Mulroney, you know? Uh, I, I really resi resist the temptation to have this nice list of, you know, number one, number two, number three. I always think you have to consider prime ministers in their own era. I know, for instance, that in uh, a number of lists, John A. Macdonald ranks very highly. 
simply because he was in some ways the country's founder, founding prime minister, governing Canada, you know, for 20 odd years and uh, died in office and uh, was important to the creation of Canada and to the foundation of Canada. Uh, but recently he's been heavily criticized because of his role in setting up the residential schools and some of his statues and his name has been removed from, from schools and, and there's been a lot of heavy criticism uh, of McDonald. Um, that's the sort of thing I mean that you know, if I went and said, oh, Johnny McDonald, put him as my number one choice. Wow, you're going to name uh, Johnny McDonald as your number one choice. And, you know, look what he did to the indigenous peoples in Canada. And this is true. You know, he, he lived at a time when racism was accepted, uh, when the great majority of Canadians thought that British civilization was superior, you know, to any other civilization, certainly superior to indigenous civilizations. Uh, that they encountered, and uh, McDonald was the same as his peer group in terms of the attitude, his attitudes there. So yes, we can rightly look back and say that was wrong, and that was racist, and that would be true, but understood in the context of its time, they, it's not at all exceptional. It was happening in the United States, it was happening in Australia and New Zealand, it was happening wherever you know, uh, Europeans had colonized, uh, the, you know, other other parts of the world. Um, Wilfrid Laurier, you know, who's also sometimes mentioned up there uh, because he governed during a time of great economic prosperity, 1896 to 1911, 15 years in power, Canada boomed during those years, grew dramatically, immigrants flooded in, the West was opened up, Laurier had to be one of the greatest. I would also say that Laurier also papered over that big division in Canada between the French and the English. He was the first French Canadian to become Prime Minister. Um, he convinced French Canadians in a way that they could continue to exist in this country because look, one of their own was the Prime Minister and he knew how to sort of manage that French-English division, which is so important for Canadian Prime Ministers to be able to do that. As for the economic part, it's hard to say that prime ministers have any control over that. I mean, all, all, all other conditions contributed to Canada's economic boom during those years. And Laurier kind of rolled the wave, you know? How much credit should he get personally for that period of, you know, economic prosperity and growth? It's hard to say, really. Uh, so that's what I mean about difficult to apply those criteria, you know, to these individuals. They all had their personal flaws. Maybe Laurier less than most. I mean, McDonald's an alcoholic, and but a very entertaining sort of politician. Despite that, and a and a tremendous um, sort of political uh, operator. Uh, the, our longest serving prime minister was our most boring prime minister, to my mind, William Lyon Mackenzie King. He's a very odd man. Um, you know, who attended seances and, you know, he sought the advice of his dead, long dead mother in these seances and his personal letters reveal kind of a very, a very strange man in some ways. Yeah. And yet he governed Canada for 20, 22 years, 22, 23 years, um, without any real vision other than keeping the country together. He was a great brokerage politician, you know, maintaining sort of the French English equilibrium within Canada and managing political, those political conflicts between regions really well and between a rising working class and, uh, you know, business interests. So he was a genius at that kind of brokering between groups, but without any big vision for the country, uninspiring as a speaker, you know, like he could stand up in Parliament and talk for an hour and sit down and you wouldn't really know what his position was on anything. You know, that kind of a politician. So do you rate him as one of the great prime ministers? I mean, he was the longest serving one. He kept Canada, you know, together during war time. Uh, so he was a success. Politically, he was a success. And if that's your criteria, it's hard to, not to say that he was 
up there, you know, maybe at the top. And then you get the big visionaries, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, you know, Brian Mulroney. You know, they both had big visions they were pursuing, different visions, but visions of the country. And Trudeau was successful at, you know, getting a new constitution, embodying his vision in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, for instance, probably his most important achievement, right? But economically, you know, the country was left in a kind of a poor position when he finally stepped down. Um, his attempts to, you know, uh, impose a different economic model for Canada, which was more uh, state-oriented and based on resource, mega projects and so on, that, that was a flop. Uh, and I don't know, you, you weigh that in the balance? You know, we had a prime minister in the 1960s, Lester Pearson, who was only there for five years, 63, 68. And yet the welfare state was created during that five years. All of our major social programs. Uh, we got a Canadian flag, you know, and we got, uh, um, well, Trudeau brought in bilingualism, but it was Pearson that appointed the B&B Commission, Bi Bilingualism, Biculturalism Commission, that recommended, you know, official bilingualism. So in a way, you know, he's only there for a short time, but he accomplished a lot you know, with minority governments uh, in the 1960s. Canada really became modern Canada during his period of time. And then Trudeau kind of carries forward with that. So Pearson Trudeau, if you put the two together, that period of time has to be, for me, when Canada, modern Canada really came to be. And th those two have to have the credit for that. So I, I put that combination at the top for me. Pierce and Trudeau. Yeah. Uh, Mulroney, I have a lot of respect for Mulroney, although he left office under a shadow, heavily criticized. His party ultimately disappears. Uh, he, he was a courageous politician, and he had a vision for Canada, and he did put Canada on a different path with the free trade agreement, especially. Uh, so I think he also has to be uh, highly ranked in the end. I so I'm not saying one, two, three, but yes. <laughs> I did say a combo that I think is the most important combo uh, in Canadian history. You know. Yeah, that's fair. I was... You need historical perspective too, like Harper, Justin Trudeau. I don't know. We, in ten years' time, maybe we can look back and make some judgment. But judgment's always obscured in the immediate aftermath. Like in the immediate aftermath of Pierre Trudeau or of, of uh, Brian Mulroney, you know. There were lots of negatives that were in the air uh, and that people were, were thinking about when they were thinking about those politicians only after a decade or two, you know, does the air clear a little bit? They say they, they had their faults. You know, Trudeau was always criticized for being standoffish and arrogant. And, and uh, Mulroney was just the opposite, right? He was, he was too much the, uh, the guy who liked to uh, make friends with presidents and become close to, you know, United States and that, that for Canadians that was always a mixed bag, right? You know, I was kind of worried about becoming too cozy with the United States, but Mulroney had no fear of that, and he played it to his advantage. Right? Uh, whereas Chrétien, when Chrétien became prime minister after Mulroney, it was no, we have to keep our distance from the United States. No, we're not going to go to war in Iraq just because you want us to, kind of thing. And Canadians also appreciated that, you know. I guess I'm copying out. You know, by not answering your question. I think we got an answer okay. for sure. Right. I'd say as far as criteria goes for me, it's the popularity, uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the term. Mm -hmm. And it's, I try not to think about the sins of the time that people participate in. You know, we don't know what in a hundred years that we do right now. Maybe fast food will be out long yeah. and we'll all be <laughs> considered gluttonous. Right. This is a terrible example off yeah. the cuff. but. Yeah. Um, that's very important to me is, is you got to separate sort of the time, as you had said, yeah. from the act. Right. But for me, I will give a top three. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will. Third okay. place is Mulrooney. So right. same as the bottom of your list. Yeah. I think one of the coldest things, cold being a good thing, one of the coldest things is that he, uh, Mulrooney called Ronald Reagan and said, you can sign a trades deal with the USSR, your worst enemy. You can't sign a deal 
for a free trade uh, with your closest ally. Uh-huh. And the free trade agreement was signed within right. an hour. You knew how to use the personal compact. That's crazy. To yeah. me. Like hearing that, that's that is very yeah. cool. Yeah. What else? I have some little things. He got the most ever seats and it's brokerage politics. It's he didn't have to be the smartest guy in the room. He just connected everybody. Yeah. And then when we're talking about that, you know, the indigenous and the like the multinational you know, uh, way that Canada has been set up. He really, at least at the beginning, was Absolutely. able to put together that. Coalition. And he, he tried very hard to put it into the Constitution. Yeah, as well as, you know, his work with ending, or helping to end apartheid and Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela um, famously was pro-Canada after that. He said Canada is an, is an ally. So that, I think, puts Brian Mulroney up there. Fair enough. I've been criticized, but I'll put Thief and Baker oh, up yeah. next. I All know right. that's a crazy, especially because yeah. we spoke about him earlier. Right. But for me, largest majority in Canadian history. First conservative. Well, after Uh Was that after Mulroney? Well, yes. yes. Well, when he had 2011, mm-hmm. he had 208. But I take your point. As a proportion of the size of the House of Commons, Thief and Baker had the biggest. Yeah, so less seats, but yeah, proportionally yeah. the biggest, as yeah. well as first conservative leader to win in 25 years. I understand the Liberals are the natural ruling party of Canada, yeah. and I've definitely been criticized that all three of my picks are conservatives, but I generally, as much as I'm the most liberalized version yeah, so of myself... So you're giving away your number one pick now. My number one pick is, uh, you know, I would say the greatest conservative leader of my lifetime. Yeah. I mean, other than maybe Angela Merkel... And we can have a conversation, though, what Bukele has done, uh, you know, forgetting about how terrible it is that he messed with the Constitution, but the fact that, you know, the murder rates down in El, Sal- El Salvador, I believe, are the lowest that they've ever been. Oh, okay. But, I mean, when we consider tr- uh, Harper, you know, he's the longest, was he not the longest serving PM, uh, conservative PM? Nine years. Nine years. So, you know, Johnny McDonald was longer. Uh, Borden was from 1911 to 1920, so he was longer. Oh, he was about the same, nine years, right? Um, no, but it's a long time for a conservative prime minister to be in power in Canada, you're right. Yeah, and I remember I remember being a child and seeing the Canadian Action Plan ads on TV, yeah. and that was the, the first moment that I realized politics was a thing. I would uh-huh. have been seven, and I remember seeing that, and, and it mattered. Uh-huh. Fiscally, he was so economically, you know, intelligent. And I understand you said earlier that how much economics can you, you know, say that the prime minister yeah. is responsible for. But if we consider that he appoints his whole council, you know, and, and the council and the bureaucracy below that are all sort of follow his call. Uh-huh. I would say Harper was, you know, helpful with that. Yeah. As well as, I mean, from my recollection, 50 years we fought for, you know, the... Quebec uh, nation status, yeah. as well as apologies for the to the indigenous people and, and to the Chinese for the head tax, and that's all stuff that I feel like Harper yeah. made under his. Yeah, you're pointing out some stuff. good good things that he did. You can definitely say you know the barbaric uh, practices hotline was awful. You know, oh, the 2015 had, election campaign. Yeah. Oh, 2015. I mean, he absolutely shit the bed. Forgive me for. <laughs> 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 but I would definitely put him up as my. Friend. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Um, so next, legalization of marijuana. What are your thoughts, and do you think that's been a success for Canada? I do think it's been a success, although not in a way that a lot of people anticipated. A lot of the anticipation was that this was going to be an economic boom for Canada, um, for a lot of businesses that jumped into it, uh, that uh, it was going to lead to you know, a big decline in um, criminal activity. You know, because a lot of it was linked to illegal sort of trade, and and so uh, that I don't think that's really come to pass. I mean, after that initial, you know, spurt, it's really settled down quite quickly. It hasn't been the 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 great uh, gold mine for a lot of people that it was anticipated it would be. Um, but it's been a success from the point of view that uh, it certainly hasn't resulted in in any major deterioration of Canadian society, as some people, you know, a minority, mind you, thought that it would, you know, if you legalize this, we're going to have nothing but dope heads walking around in Canada, you know, the whole economy will crash and, you know, crime will go through the roof. None of that happened. In fact, it turned out that, you know, it's become pretty normalized. And, 
not a lot of people who, who didn't smoke marijuana before took it up. And those who did, oftentimes for, they did for medical reasons, you know, that it helped with this condition or that condition and just made it easier for them to, you know, to, uh, to, to get uh, their, their marijuana than it was previously. So I think that's worked out quite well, actually. Uh, the provinces were given a lot of leeway in how they managed, you know, the marketing of it. Uh, which is probably smart because it wasn't the federal government imposing one model on the provinces. You know, the federal government had control of the criminal criminal law, but it was provinces that really decide how people are going to be able to purchase marijuana, when and where and how. You know. So all in all, I'd say it's worked out pretty good. Yeah, I think I think that it's wrong to have anybody thrown in jail for smoking marijuana. Yeah. But at the same time, I also feel like it's addictive nature, and you know, essentially. The, how normalized it is in the youth, I think that's something that maybe deserves more consideration. Yeah. But I don't. I also don't think there's anything you can really do about it. I mean, yeah. realistically, it's, it's like, like alcohol. I mean, exactly. it's addictive too. Uh, but you can't. They tried to ban it in the twenties, uh, prohibition, you know, and it just created a terrible mess. Um, so I agree with you. I think you know, you can you can. Do your best to, to regulate it and to, to try to deal with any negative consequences associated with it. But I don't think you can hope to eliminate it, you know. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, electoral reform. This yeah. is, uh, this is it's a pet, time. pet peeve of mine, too. I would love to know your, your thoughts on electoral reform. Yeah, well, you've heard me talk about it in class. And uh, it, it is the one Canadian political institution, the electoral system, that I think has ill-served Canada. Um, especially given our highly regional country that we have, inevitably, because of the geography of the country, uh, the ethno-linguistic division, uh, you're going to, regional politics is going to be very strong, no matter what, I think. And it's a question of does, do your political institutions make it worse? And I think that that one political institution that's made it worse is the electoral system. And that if only we could except that there may be something better than what we have now. I mean, people are very reluctant. You know, they all, better the devil we know than the one we don't. And they think that a, a change in a political institution like that uh, might result in something worse than what we have. And they recognize the problems with what we have. You know, it's an electoral system that distorts voter preferences. It's a winner-take-all. A lot of people are left unrepresented at the end of the day. You know, their choices aren't anywhere represented. Just for the listener, why would their vote not be represented? Through yeah, well, system? when you think about uh, our system, which is first past the post, but I mean the technical name for it would be, you know, single member, simple plurality, electoral system. It's used in Britain, it's used in the United States, it's used in Canada, and uh, a small number of other countries. Most countries, democratic countries in the world, don't use our electoral system. They use some kind of proportional representation. So uh, that's the alternative. So in our system, in uh, many uh, constituencies, people are elected with less than a majority. That is, less than 50% of the vote. And sometimes as little as... 30% or even lower, depending on how many people are running in the election, uh, will be elected on that basis, but they're the only person elected. It's a winner take all. So all those other votes for the other candidates basically get thrown out at the end of the day. And it's just the person who managed to get the most votes that ends up representing that constituency, even though the majority of people may not want to that party or that person, you know. Uh, and whole regions of the country can be dominated as a result by one party. You know, if you can manage to get half the votes in a region, like the Conservatives do, for instance, in the West, you can win almost all the seats. And so the West looks like nothing but Conservatives in the House of Commons. But that's not a true reflection of the population. You know, if half of the people voted for other parties. And I'll just use that as an example. You can also say Quebec was the same thing. You know, for decades and decades, nothing but liberals, even though half the people were voting for other parties. So 
I think that that's not a healthy situation. Politically speaking, it would be better if people's true preferences were more accurately represented and proportional representation would do that. You, know, you elect people to parliament, parties, win a certain proportion of the vote, they should have that as a proportion of seats they have in parliament. And that would be a much fairer representation. People wouldn't feel like they have to vote for this party because you know, they, they, they're the only party that has a chance of winning. Whereas they'd rather vote for the other party but they know they don't have a chance in that local constituency, so they don't. It's called strategic voting. Uh, so you would eliminate those problems if you had some kind of proportional representation system. We've had numerous studies of the electoral system in Canada. They all have come back, I mean all of them, saying, yes, we should change. Usually they say some kind of hybrid system that combines what we have now with more proportional representation is the way to go. But Canadians have been very reluctant to vote for a change when they've had the opportunity. They tended to turn it down, uh, which is unfortunate. I think it's partly, you know, that they're, they, you know, people are busy. They don't have the time to think about these things in depth. Uh, the parties that are in power now really don't have any incentive to change the system. It's working well for them, you know, but I do think it would result in a better uh, a better politics than we have now. A, f a fairer one, a more just one, more democratic one, that's my opinion. Yeah, and that's a super valid opinion. I mean, I actually, as much as I spoke ill of Trudeau earlier, uh, Junior, like Justin, yeah. um, he said, make the vote count over 1,800 times before his 2015 election, as with electoral reform being one of his key pillars. Yeah. And if I was me today, and I was looking at the options, I'm almost certain I would have voted Trudeau just off of that. But did he do? Well, after he, he tabled it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He killed it after he gained yeah. power. So that's what I mean. It's really hard to get. Because whatever party wins power, hey, we benefited from that electoral system. We don't want to change it. So that was very unfortunate. Mm. I have a major criticism of Trudeau for, for reneging on that promise, which was a heartfelt promise, it seemed to be. It does go to show that it is an important aspect of Canadian politics, though, just, yeah. you know, given that that was something he ran on his platform. The last question, I'd like to hear about your opinion on Quebec secession movements. Okay. Do you think that's a resolved issue, or do you think this is something that Canada is going to deal with in the future? Well, I think we'll have to continue to deal with it. That's because it's based on Quebec nationalism. And almost all French-speaking Quebecers are nationalists. They believe in the idea of the Quebec nation, and they believe that they should be in some way uh, regarded as such by English-speaking Canadians and respected as a nation with a different culture uh, and given the autonomy that they need to pursue their priorities or their vision of what kind of society they want. And inevitably, this creates tensions. You know, we see it around immigration right now, uh, where the Premier of Quebec is demanding total control over immigration into, into Quebec. And yet, immigration, control over immigration is one of the primary things that national governments everywhere have control over. And to give that up to one region of the country is very difficult for the federal government to do that. Um, and politically it sells well, especially through overall Quebec, uh, these kinds of uh, appeals that say we're being somehow denied uh, our recognition as a nation by the federal government, by other English-speaking Canadians, um, because they're preventing us from making our own decisions about this or that. Now Canada has gone a long way towards giving Quebec the kind of economy it needs to more or less have a different society than you find in the rest of Canada, within limits, right? So there, anyone who goes to Quebec immediately recognizes, besides the fact that it's a French-speaking society, that there are just some things that are different here in terms of policies and programs and so on. So. We are, and there have been studies that have verified this, the most decentralized federation in the world. Uh, our provinces 
are the strongest subnational governments anywhere in the world. And of those 10 provinces, three territories, Quebec is the most autonomous. You know, they control certain things that other provinces don't because Quebec wanted its own pension plan and wanted its own sort of family policies. Um, and other provinces, until Alberta recently said they want their own pension plan, but until now, other provinces are happy with Canada's pension. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they were getting something we didn't have. You no, know, they we have it too. But ours is the Canada pension plan, theirs is the Quebec pension plan, and it's the same for the other things. The differential. So I think Canada has managed to cope with Quebec nationalism and to make changes in the way in which the Federation works in order to ensure that Quebec nationalism doesn't turn into outright separatism. Mm -hmm. But it's always possible, wherever you look around the world, that sub-state nationalism, minority nationalism, tends to push towards more and more autonomy with the ultimate outcome for, in a lot of places, being separate statehood. Uh, We've seen that in Canada, or two referendums, referendums on independence. 95, it was only 10,000 votes going the other way. Would have made the difference. You know, out of 8 million Quebecers, 10,000 votes. So it was really hairline close. But since then, it's support for separatism has declined somewhat. But there seems to be a hardcore, you know, 30% of Quebecers who are always being committed to the idea of Quebec as a, its own nation state. I, I don't think that's going to change, honestly. And I think that Canada and English-speaking Canadians have learned how to swallow this and accept it. You know, they had a hard time with it for a long time. But I think over the past couple of decades, they've come to terms with it. They don't get upset about Quebec calling itself a nation like they used to. Uh, they accept that Quebec's going to do some things differently, whereas they had a hard time accepting that before. So I think... You know, since Pierre Trudeau left office, he was opposed to all all this uh, separate status for Quebec. English-speaking Canadians have gradually come to accept, you know, Quebec's differences, um, and uh, I think that it's put us on a more solid footing uh, going into the future. So I think we could buck the trend, and we could stay together as a country, even with uh, a very Autonomous, you know, Quebec as part of as part of the country. With respect to time, I want to ask you super quickly. Yes. Because uh, you had said that Canada has the most decentralized provinces, like the most Quebec. decentralized federation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does that sort of line up with our massive levels of federal subsidy? Like with with the federal government sort of paying for a lot of things. Yeah. How do the provincial governments get sort of the go ahead to operate outside of that sort of scope? Well, it. The way fiscal federalism works in Canada, um, in most federations, the United States, Germany, Brazil, um, Mexico, the federal, the federal government also gives grants to the provinces or states, but with conditions. So we're transferring this money to you to run this program. Here are the conditions. You have to run this kind of program with these kinds of conditions, blah, blah, blah. So the federal government is still really in charge of things. They're just giving the money to the provinces to put the program in place. In Canada, almost all the money the federal government transfers to the provinces, and it's a lot. I mean, for social programs, for equalization payments, and so on. It's unconditional transfers hmm. with no strings attached or very few, like the Canada Health Act. There's very few strings attached to the Canada Health Act transfer, the biggest single transfer we make. Um, so the provinces have to stay within those sort of parameters, but they're very kind of loosey-goosey. And provinces, you know, uh, more or less run the show in terms of health care. And that's the same for other social programs, too. Um, so, yeah, a lot of federal money uh, is uh, transferred to provinces. But provinces are really in control, uh, for the most part, of uh, how they spend that money. And that's created some tensions within the Federation. Uh, currently, the federal government wants more money to go into housing. 
provinces, some provinces are saying, wait a minute now, that's our jurisdiction. We don't want you talking to cities and towns directly. We want you to give us the money, and then we'll decide how we're going to manage the housing. You know? I know Alberta takes that position, absolutely, under Daniel Smith, but so does Quebec. They're usually the two most autonomy-seeking autonomy -seeking provinces. Uh, so that's going to continue, and the politics of fiscal federalism are going to continue. The federal government, generally speaking, has greater ability to raise money, because they tax right across the country. Uh, they can raise more money than any individual province can because of that. Uh, the provinces are often a little short on the cash, especially the poorer provinces. They need that money in order to run the programs because they're heavily laden with all these responsibilities that the Constitution has given them over social programs especially. So they need more money than they can raise on their own. So you're always going to have that issue in mm -hmm. Canadian federalism. And over time, you know, we've learned how to have a fairly high level of social programs run by the provinces but heavily funded by the federal government. But I think the tensions are inevitable in a federation, and especially a decentralized federation like ours, where the provinces really are running most of what government does. It's, it's, it's really run by the provinces, right? Thank you for that. Okay. Um, as we conclude, uh, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience or, or any sort of speculations on the future of Canadian politics? <laughs> I am a bit of an optimist. I know we're going through some tough times uh, with inflation, for instance, in the wake of uh, the COVID epidemic, and then we have a big bout of inflation that's made affordability a huge issue. But it's not a Canadian issue. It's an international issue. And other countries are uh, oftentimes in worse straits than Canada is in terms of how they're managing the issue. But I think that we're over that hump now. And I think that uh, things are going to improve uh, over the short to medium term. Over the next couple of years, we're going to see a definite improvement in all of that. I mean, there's longer term issues about economic competitiveness and productivity, which is, you know, that's in the air right now. Why isn't Canada more productive? And they have a measure of productivity. It has to be more investment and so on. But Canada's always had that issue, to be frank. I can remember as a grad student in the 1980s, and productivity was a big issue back with him. You know, uh, but we have so many advantages as a country. And again, I talked about this in the course, and, you know, all of the advantages Canada has. When you look at Canada from a global context, we have so much going for us in terms of the quality of the people and the quality of the resources we have and, you know, political stability and, the, you know, the, 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 the tremendous technology that we're, we have embodied in our in our society, you're using some of it today for this podcast. I just think Canada has too many things going for it. Multiculturalism, you know, uh, not to succeed in the long run. So yeah, there's going to be bumps, as there always have been bumps. But when you compare us to the rest of the world, I still think Canada is still a pretty darn good place to live. I want to thank you kindly for coming on today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Ed. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Pleasure. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks for listening, everyone. Okay, thank you, everybody.